task this morning is to talk about going. And I think Lisa made very clear, and the readings that we had in church this morning, and um, if you're just arriving and you're going to hear her homily at 11, you will hear that there are an awful lot of interpretations of what this particular part of Jesus' path means. But universally, it has something to do with action. And she advised us not to jump into action, which, if you know me, you know that's almost impossible. Um, but I'm going to try this week to just pay attention and pause and reflect before I jump whole hog into whatever it is that I need to do. So as we have been doing for these weeks, we've been focusing on one of the different imperative verbs. This one, go. And specifically, it means, as, um, as our group has defined it, to cross boundaries, to listen deeply, and that's not something you automatically associate with action. And it maybe isn't just listening deeply, maybe it's look carefully. Uh, maybe it's inhale, you know, you might have left the burner on. Um, maybe it's look around and see, maybe it's listen hard. And live like Jesus, and that's the action part. So this morning, um, we have the, maybe the, most powerful or famous parable Jesus ever preached, maybe tied with the prodigal son. Maybe you have other favorites, but this is the one that whenever I suggest to students, so, can, I, can you think of a parable? They think of the Good Samaritan. And my students also, understandably, imagine that a Samaritan's really nice. That a Samaritan is a synonym for good guy. But when Jesus told the story, as I think many of you know, it was the opposite. Samaritan was sort of like, you're a Viking fan and a Samaritan would be a Packers fan. <laughs> or, um, or it could be worse. It could be you're in one army and the Samaritans are on the other side of the battle lines. Or it could be you're in two different political parties and you see the world so differently and everything for you is the opposite of whatever a Samaritan would say. It's almost impossible for us to feel how shocking the juxtaposition of good and Samaritan are. That's why Jesus picked that name, and it's almost like every generation should come up with a new name for it. Whoever it is that we don't like and look down upon and insert that name. But we don't do that with scripture. Instead, we study it and try and make sense of it. So, let's read this. Um, I'll just read it and you listen. But the expert, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, Man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. This is a story, by the way. This is not something that Jesus saw. This is something he imagined. And the man fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went off, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, but when he saw the injured man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came up to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But, a Samaritan who was traveling came to where the injured man was, and when he saw him, he felt compassion for him. He went up to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring olive oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. Whatever else you spend, I will repay you when I come back this way. So Jesus is finished telling the story and he turns to the experts in the law and he says, which of these three do you think became a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in religious law said, the one who showed mercy to him. So Jesus said to him, go 
and do the same. So, what we've been having you do is a simple exercise. Go around the table and everybody say a few words about what stood out for you in that reading. Take a couple of minutes, what stood out for whatever reason? You've always loved it or you never heard it that way before or John read it really loud so it must mean something. <laughs> Thank you for your conversation. Um, so what did the rest of us miss who aren't lucky enough to be sitting at your table? What did you hear? What, what did anybody say? What did you pick up? What did you learn? Uh, I'm, I'm not a plant. I'm just uh, Yeah, so uh, I discussed with the table. Uh, what would fill in for the Samaritan uh, as essentially the good enemy in this day and age? That is, the group that we sometimes shun, but is actually has components of mercy and compassion in it. Well, I think somebody at our table said that we are, we are all of them. That we play, we can recognize ourselves in each one of those roles. And that I think it's less about condemning the two the one. And it's more about recognizing that you can be startled, both in whom you can see to serve and. Um, who else? Beth. Um, we were reminded at our table. Look closer. We were reminded at our table by Tim um, who the Levite is supposed to be and, and all the. Um, the information that goes around that particular person and why yeah. that, why Jesus chose that person. And could you tell us, or have Tim do it? <laughs> Let Tim do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I posed the question because I couldn't remember. I think I, I knew it one time or heard a sermon, you know, that talked about the Levi. But I think Steve just had some insight about, um, you know, that just that it would have been somewhat of privilege or a priestly caste. Um, and that, you know, to reach out or, you know, um, to not cross on the other side would have, would have been uh, to become unclean or to, you know, do something that, you know, wasn't within their, their normal uh, understanding of the world. So, um, and just as I was sitting here, I was just thinking, this is why parables are so, they can do things that, that other types of uh, um, readings or literal, um, uh, instruction just just can't get at there's so many layers to this and it just it sticks with us you know you remember these stories and, and they're so multi-layered and um, can be applied in so many different ways so yeah yeah I think Tim's right nobody goes home from a in-service quoting the employee handbook <laughs> Nothing against employee handbooks, but that's prose. Those are bullet points. Those are slides with way too many words on them, cheerful graphics that just don't make you feel better. But a story, especially when you learn from a guy like Steve, that Levites were a privileged caste who had a lot of taboos. And they took those taboos seriously, and we may make fun of those taboos. But we have plenty of little rituals that we do, some of them based in hygiene, like we wash our hands before we eat. But you watch Major League Baseball players step into the batter's box. Right? Or a golfer on the tee, you watch what they do. Or me, before I teach a class, I am unable to teach a class without a cup in my hand with a hot beverage in it. That's silly. But a Levite, had particular religious taboos and some extra privileges, and a priest did also. Those guys were going up to Jerusalem, and the guy, the victim, was going down. And in a minute, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that road. But the going up and the going down is a really important part of that story, and don't ask me to tell you why. I'm going to ask you, as you're talking about it, to see what you think. Because, as Tim said, it could mean all kinds of things. How about a couple more comments before? Yeah, Chrissy. 
simply brought up the question of um, if we were in that place um, and we were either, who would we be? Would we be the Levite or the Samaritan? Would we go out of our way um, to be uncomfortable, to do something out of the norm, uh, to go to help? Or would we uh, stay within our comfort zone, go to the other side so as not to get <coughs> dirty, so to speak? Uh, and I think about that when I think about what's going on in our world right now, things in the past that have gone on in the world, and you know, in, in 30, 40 years, what am I going to think of myself? Did I do something to help, or did I do something as a bystander. <coughs> Anyone else? I like to think of myself as a good person, but I recognize that I'm a Levite every day. When I drive past homeless people on corners, and it's um, humbling. Yeah, I usually try not to even look, <laughs> which I could just look and smile and, you know, touch my hand to my chest or something, or I could just say a prayer, but no, I'm just like you. You do that? Well, good for you, and they start doing that. I want to show you a picture of the traditional site in the Holy Land of this parable. And of course, because Jesus made this story up, it could be anywhere on the road from Jerusalem, altitude about 3,000 feet, to Jericho, altitude about 1,500 feet below sea level. And it's not a real long trip. It is so downhill the whole way. If you're going from Jerusalem, the capital, the big city, to Jericho, this dry, dusty, really, really hot place that doesn't have walls anymore. And there's that road, and just look at all the places where bad guys could hide. And people coming from Jerusalem often had a lot of money on them, or goods to be traded, or a string of donkeys with stuff for the market. And in particular, um, Jesus wants us to think of the loneliness of the place. He wants us to think that it's kind of out on the margins of society. And he wants us to recognize, I think, that the poor fellow who got beaten up what had the harder path he was coming up uh, the road. I believe the Samaritan was too. Oh, this is just going to slow everybody down. Can anybody tell? The priest was going down, the Levite was, and the Levite was coming up. Ha! I never saw that. <laughs> the Samaritan was traveling, came there. Okay, so the Samaritan could be either way. Here's what I'd like you to do. Um, I'm going to do just a little mental meditation with you. Um, so close your eyes again, and uh, if you want. And um, I want you to imagine um, what it's like on a very hot day. Uh, there's not much traffic. It's a couple thousand years ago, so it's not vehicular traffic at all. It's everybody on foot. And you're either going up or you're going down. And I want you to think a little bit about Lois's question. She wonders whether we aren't all of these people. So imagine if you're the Levite or the priest, and you have all these religious taboos, you may have just said all the cleansing prayers, maybe taken a bath, washed up, maybe anointed yourself religiously for the duties of the day. 
And you know that if you touch a dead body, you will have to go back to the temple and undergo purification. And you know if you're a Samaritan, you're from kind of far away, and you're not really in your neck of the woods. And probably everybody around you is looking at you funny, and they can tell by your clothes who you are. And they wonder what you've got in your animal, in those bags. And I don't know about you, but the one guy in this story I never imagined myself being is the one who got beat up. But what if that's you? What does the gravel feel like? What do your wounds feel like? What are you expecting is going to happen? Are you afraid of losing consciousness? Have you quit crying out for help? The sun is so hot. You're drifting in and out of awareness. You hear some footsteps go by. Maybe you cry out to them. Maybe you see who they are and you know they're not going to stop. Then you find yourself being picked up and put on an animal, very awkwardly, I'm sure. Pretty soon you're in an inn, probably a Jericho. Maybe you can wash up yourself. Maybe somebody has to give you a bath. So now picturing this story, go ahead and open your eyes and I have a specific question for you. I swear that I did not talk um, to Lois this morning, but here's my, here's my first question. We are all priests and Levites. Discuss. We confess our sins every Sunday. Yes, it was actually a challenge to Today we're talking about go, and obviously you're supposed to go. All right, you're not supposed to stop or ignore. Um, but this particular question troubles us because these are all the times when we don't go. We don't cross the boundary. We don't stop the car, put it in park, reach for the wallet. We don't go across the playground to that kid who's all alone and if we're a kid. For a teacher maybe we do, but that doesn't have nearly the power as when another kid does it. And welcome that kid. We are all priests and Levites. We're all privileged. We all have our habits and taboos. All of us in this room anyway are sort of religious, or, or we're not, but we're kind of hoping to do better. Um, so what'd you come up with uh, about your priestliness or your Leviteness? And it would be amazing if somebody could not insult priests and Levites, because that's so easy, it's so obvious that they're the bad guys, but Jesus, like in those Beatitudes and Woes, was not saying they're bad. So we had a couple of things come up. Um, one person talked about how we are in those patterns or in those habits and we might not 
see the person who's needing something because we're moving through our day and through our to-do list and there's somebody who needs something from us but we're, you know, gotta get to the next thing, gotta keep moving, gotta move forward. And it's really easy to get caught up in those, those to-do lists and not to see the person standing next to you who's in pain or in need. Um, I, because that's who I am, thought of fairy tales and thought about how um, in fairy tales where there are three brothers, the first two brothers have the opportunity to make the choice that will lead them into the adventure and then they get the treasure or the princess or become the king or whatever, but because they can't see past their own goal, they don't turn aside and help the old woman or the little gray man or the whoever it is and they don't win and they don't get the prize at the end um, but in every moment we are faced with these choices and we can choose to see the call to adventure or we can choose to stay in the village and so when you're a fairy tale person like me and a, a scholar of myth then you say you start to see in every breath there's a call to adventure in every interaction with other people. You can choose to say yes to the adventure or you can choose to continue forward. And the, the Samaritan said yes, but the priest and the Levite aren't necessarily bad, they just weren't able to answer the call yet. There are external expectations and external rules. There are ways that we want to set the external whatever. Um, but, it, but more and more I sort of feel like it's what is God calling me to do in this particular situation. Um, and that may or may not be the external rule. We talked about an example that I think might be classified as maybe going from a Levite to a <laughs> Samaritan in the same breath. Uh, when we see the people by the highway, would like to have some money. Some of our social service friends would say it's not helping them to give money. So we talked about a time when we were giving uh, a bag of things to people and wondering, well, it's not money. Maybe they won't like it. But in our experience, they did appreciate it. So maybe it was a way of trying to be a useful Samaritan, which may or may not always have. I am frightened in situations where, you know, it's, it's wilderness out there, there could be no robbers behind every rock. I don't know if guys experience it the same way. You're a guy, you want to answer that? <laughs> I, I don't think I do, and I'm married to a very fierce woman. But I am, but I am certainly less afraid in situations than she is, and far less than my sister. So, you know, it's a handicap. I will say, by the by, that one of the things I learned from a friend in Denver is that I always carry in my car cans of tuna fish, the kind that you can open with the little lever, and I hand them out to people standing beside the freeway, with a sign that say, hungry, need something, whatever. So I always have them. Yeah. Yeah, really helpful. Um, I would say that um, approaching the problem structurally is a good idea, not just as you or me as an individual. And especially in our neighborhood where I live, uh, the people on the street, according to the police, are part of a gang of about 55 people. They don't have guns, but they have knives, and they uh, there's a a guy who's in charge of them, who drops them off in the morning, picks them up, and he provides them with alcohol and food at the end of the day. So a lot of this is structural. It's not just you and me. The other thing I'd like um, to suggest is that we see the innkeeper as pretty cool. Yeah. Um, this parable is taken in the Middle Ages to have been a parable of the church that is the Good Samaritan acts like Jesus, and then the innkeeper is the Holy Spirit, and the bread and wine is at the sacraments that are given out. This is, if you go to Chartres, you know, the, this parable is up there. It's quite explicit. And so I think um, we can bemoan ourselves as being, oh, the priest, oh no. 
But I think we should aspire to be in the hospitality um, <laughs> vocation of really looking out for people. And that's what we did in the Episcopal Church that I was part of in Boston. We had a soup kitchen every Thursday. We had about 100 people. Um, and then we also got people into shelters who wanted to be. So I think I would hate to lose the innkeeper. He's yeah. my, he or she is I my innkeeper. I want to say something. <laughs> I am in social services, and there's another point of view here, and it, it is important to give people money, because if they have money, they can buy a room for the night and get out of the cold. So try to keep that in mind, too. There are criminals out there, but I think they're in the minority. Most people could use money. So, what do you think? Think about those characters and how it is that we personally are that. I thought it would be interesting to read to you what the kids have said in uh, in recent weeks. He's got a a poster here, and not always on just one week, but as these things have come up. Um, Kids have said, for go, how often, the question is, do you practice the way of love? Remove yourself from a situation. That's an example of go. Go work it out. Go talk to them. Play with new kids. Make them feel at home. Take a break. Talk to somebody new every day. Sit with somebody at lunch who's by themselves. Invite someone sad to play with you. And then the last one is the buddy bench, which is that famous therapeutic piece of playground furniture. Um, we just have a moment or two before we close with a prayer, but I wonder if anybody particularly wanted to confess their beatenness or their Samaritanness <laughs> or brag about their mercifulness. Because now people are probably pretty lonely and most of us like on the streets downtown we'll just walk by now you had a great story of a guy who asked him what he needed called amazon and got it delivered <laughs> but i i think i think all of us at some level are kind of lonely and maybe that's a piece of what we stay away from It's not that the person is so different from us, it's that the person on a level that we don't want to acknowledge is very much us. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. I'll share one of the things that Patrick said, which is I think one of the things that makes us um, priests and Levites as well is, is worrying about doing the right thing according to somebody else's idea of doing the right thing. And maybe that taps into sort of our need of approval or accomplishing something and getting things right according to a certain way of doing things. And often you have to throw that out. So when you do see somebody who needs help, there's no evaluation committee over your shoulder making sure you're doing the right thing for them. And when you hear what all of those kids say, you're sort of reminded, like, it's just a very basic thing. Like, are you okay? It just starts there, you know? It, it's so simple and basic and easy, but we sort of feel like, Oh, we might do it wrong, so we just won't do it. So here's our closing prayer. I wonder if you would say it with me. Together. Merciful God, through baptism, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Help me to trust that Christ is in me and calling me to go and serve Christ in all persons. Go in peace. Go in peace. <laughs> to love and serve God by serving all of you.